get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs, leaders. I am really excited about today's episode. We're going to dig in deep in, and there's some contrarian beliefs here, I think. Um, and that's why I'm so excited about this. And before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their, to their dream relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, uh, Scott, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships and profile the people and companies I admire and shout out from the rooftop so other people can discover their thought leadership and what they're doing. So I've been doing it for over 10 years. I would never stop doing it because I've formed amazing friendships, relationships, business relationships, whatever it is, gone on vacations with people's families because of the people I've met and maybe I'll visit Scott in New Orleans or he'll come to Chicago and we'll hang out and have dinner. And so if you've thought about starting a podcast, I believe you should. Um, if you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us and we're happy to answer any and all things that you have questions about. Today's episode, I am excited. Um, we have CEO Scott Kuvion of Trumpet and they're in New Orleans and you know, it's really interesting what Trumpet does. And I love the very simple slogan. They create believable brands and they're an advertising agency that builds believable brands. They help companies align elements of culture, customer experience, anything that communicates with a unifying belief that permits organizations to live their purpose. Um, and Scott, thanks for joining me. Yeah, no, good. glad to be here. I want to mention too, you've been doing this for a couple of decades now. Um, and so I love to hear your thought leadership on it. And I kind of wanted just to start with you sharing a little bit about, um, what the company does. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't say I've been doing exactly this for decades, but yeah, we've been definitely been in the business for a long time since, uh, kind of the mid nineties and bounced from, you know, very traditional small shops to very traditional large shops to more creative shops on the. Uh, in New Orleans, out on the West Coast, mainly San Francisco area, um, uh, back home, but, you know, kind of missed the pace that, you know, I got used to out on the West Coast. So I think we were always trying to think beyond the market, um, always trying to think beyond, you know, the, the traditional stuff. Um, and over the years, uh, we have really narrowed in on a perspective that uh, guides the agency for sure. I mean, we're, we're, we're betting our business that this perspective is smarter than the traditional advertising, you know, spray and pray model. So um, uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, yeah, at, at the perspective is pretty simple. I mean, and you, you touched on it. Um, most companies live at the product level. You know, they're clear on what it is that they make or build or manufacture. And, and then they, they go to market and they promote it. And 99 times out of 100, uh, as consumers, what we're faced with every day when we're getting advertised at is you know, features and benefits and practical uh, goodness of products and services that, that manufacturers are, are making. Um, and manufacturers aren't just people that weld stuff and put bolts into holes. You know, the, you can live at the product level as a hospital or you can be more purposeful. You can live at the product level as a bank or a destination or a resort or a leisure brand or a cruise um, uh, or a sh apparel grocery store. I mean, this is in every single category. There are players that are more purposeful than they are product centric. Um, you know, those are the companies that we really look for, uh, either because they are and they want to go further in that direction, or because they aren't and they want to begin uh, transforming their enterprise from from being hyper practical to being you know slightly more emotional. Scott, it's interesting. When we were talking before we hit record, you um, made a comment actually last time we talked, which I thought was interesting because we always picture this purposeful company being this always giving Tom shoes. And you made the statement purposeful doesn't always have to mean nice. So I'd love for you to expand on what that means. And what are some examples of that? Cause that's just what I visualize. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a, it's mis. I mean, look, the, the conversation about purpose is not a new one. Um, this has been in organizations and Ross is so just conscious capitalism where he's talking about, you know, what, what the, the defining trait of some of the highest performing net profit companies, what they have in common. I mean, this has been talked about for a long time. Um, 
But I do think that there has been a, a just a misconstruing that that purposeful is altruistic, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, absolutely, companies that are altruistic, and I would say that Tom Shoes has an altruistic bent to it. You know, you buy a pair of shoes, and somebody else is going to get one, um, and that that is definitely a part of their culture. But um, but a non altruistic purpose, you take Amazon. You know, they're not they're not given anything to anybody in Africa, as far as I know, but, um, but their promise is not necessarily, you know, it is practical in nature, but the promise is convenience. And if that is what we uh, believe that our relationship with them is predicated upon, um, as long as it is convenient, they are satisfying that promise. You know, if they were saying they were convenient and they were inconvenient, you know, because their culture didn't, wasn't, united in convenience that the product or customer experience had nothing you know was not convenient then advertising would be making a promise that the company wasn't trying to keep but uh and and really that's the that's the that's the bit you know if a if a bank were honest and said you know we are in the business of making max profit for our shareholders um well then when we experienced you know loan terms from that bank uh, we wouldn't be shocked <laughs> because we know who it is that ultimately uh, they serve. Now, banks aren't that honest uh, when they are serving a principle like that. Um, and usually marketers are more dishonest than honest. Making a promise to consumers, it just isn't true uh, in practice because the experience doesn't live up to what the advertising promise was and the culture isn't united in that purpose. So. But yeah, purpose doesn't need to be nice. doesn't need to be altruistic. It just needs to be emotional. It needs to be clear. And then it needs to be alive within the organization. It's easy to talk to it in ads. It's, it's a little harder to live it. Uh, but when you do, um, these are what the most, some of the most functional, highest net sustained profit companies in the world have in common. They're united in a belief. Um, the culture is bathed in it. Everybody buys into it. Um, they're happy to be there. Turnover is low. Executive retention is high. The supply chain isn't miserable. Everything. These are easier companies to run. Uh, that's the same culture that's responsible for a customer experience. That customer experience is going to be an extension of that belief. Advertising just becomes an invitation to participate in that culture through the experience of, you know, typically predicated on a purchase, but not exclusive to it. You know, um, an iPhone is a phone, just like a Galaxy is a phone, but we have there's a deeper uh, connection between iPhone buyers and Apple than there are between Galaxy owners and Samsung. Nothing bad about Samsung, but it's part of the reason why an uh, iPhone can fetch twice as much. I love to walk through, I love my Samsung, by the way, but probably not as passionate about it as, uh, as the iPhone users and people are trying to convert me over. Why don't you have an iPhone? But um, I'd love to understand more about your work uh, to Scott through um, Credit Human, and what did you do there? Yeah, well, Credit Human's a, an awesome story. I mean, that is a, uh, it's a financial institution in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Um, you know, they have, they, they have great plans, but uh, it was an organization that was in, you know, by all accounts, great shape. Uh, they had, you know, a lot of money under management. They had an aging membership. It's a credit union, so um, it's, a, it's a member organization. They're technically nonprofit. Um, so they serve their members more than, than, uh, shareholders. Um, but there was this, a CEO, uh, came in by the name of Steve Hennigan, you know, great guy. Um, not, I need to leave a great legacy, but just naturally a legacy lever and, um, and really came in with a, with a, 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 a an amazing business acumen, but also an emotional premise that he was going to remake this organization from the inside out. Now, rather than just being selfless in service of members, which conceivably every credit union should be, they were very discreet and very specific. And we, we were fortunate enough to kind of be along from the ride from, from the inception, from when he came on. And the, the definition of that purpose, you know, deciding to be something very specific, serving you know, the dignity of those members by creating financial slack in members. That was how they were going to do it. it the, the conversations about products and services that this institution was going to offer was almost tertiary. You know, the, the, what they were going to mean um, in the life of the members was of utmost importance. You know, the, 
the organization really bought into that. And then when they started thinking about what are the products of the things that we're going to build, you know, because they don't exist and we need them to, if we're going to really live this purpose, what are the things that we're doing that are contrary to what we've articulated as this belief? Um, and they got rid of those things. So they invented practices, but not from just leadership top down, but by empowering and enabling, you know, individuals all the way through the culture from top to bottom to just understand what the purpose is, believe in why you're here and be excited about being here and, and how would that affect your day to day. So while they ultimately changed their name from San Antonio Credit Union to Credit Human, uh, that moniker is shorthand for a, a, a real true emotional honest alignment inside of that organization. It's not just a clever play on words. So they were really able to bring that from the from the inside out, and um, and it it shows, you know, the 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 satisfaction of members, the satisfaction of employees. Everybody's buying into something. They're not just you know buying savings and checking accounts and auto loans and the kinds of things that you would expect to find from a from any fiduciary. You know, it starts with the internal culture. Um, how do they? an organization like that disseminate that how do they actually embed that so that the staff like lives it and breathes it yeah no it's it, that's that's the most critical part right um the it should be said that purpose is not something that you know when we're work when we're involved in the infant steps and stages of this process we're not making something up that we hope they grow into i, I think it's important to note that you know, 99 times out of 100, unless you're you know talking to a true practical, uh, you know, founded with venture capital commodity product manufacturer, where you do have to invent a story, <laughs> you do have to actually fabricate something that wasn't there. Um, it, these elements of you know the the values weren't written this way, but the, the the values of the organization were you know more dignified than normal. I mean, it helped that they're a nonprofit credit union as opposed to a for-profit bank. But uh, even beyond that, there were things evident in, in the culture. Um, nonetheless, the job one is drawing out, distilling, you know, articulating what that core belief is, simplifying it to the point that it can be activated you know, at every level inside of the organization. And then that rollout is not unimportant. You know, when you're ideally, uh, there would be participation throughout the organization in the development of that of that narrative, but um, in some organizations, that's that's easier said than done. Um, but that internal transmission is really important. In fact, it, it's not always the case with our clients, but it, especially in the case of of that particular um, situation, there were two, maybe three years of internal work, um, rethinking, retraining. Um, started with the executives, went all the way down into the employee base, um, but really offering people the opportunity to buy in, you know, really offering people the opportunity to escape <laughs> if they didn't want to buy in and uh, and bringing the organization around to that, you know, to the depth that they did it was really amazing for us to watch because, it, you know, we're not complaining that it's pushing an advertising launch back two or three years. Because by the time we're out there making a promise, we can make a, a an honest commitment to a marketplace because we know that the company is going to be able to keep that promise once people start walking through the door with that with that in mind. Um, so, but that transmission is is not unimportant. You know, we call these brand transformations when you go from either not being something to being something or to being the wrong thing. You know, we are here to make money, uh, and that is it. You know, profit is a result, not a, a, a focus or a goal. And if it is, it's like that squiggly thing in your eye. You, you, the longer you try to look at it, you know, the less likely you are to see it. Um, but you know, when you see profit as a result and being very intentional as the focus and the goal, you know, it's kind of the only predictable way to get the result of being profitable. So um, that that you have to bring internal along for the ride. You know, we we talk all the time about because we're in an advertising agency. Um, it is safer for us to talk about features and benefits and do free delivery and, and 99 cent off promotion kind of stuff as an advertising agency because those things work. You know, advertising is an efficient, unfortunately, sometimes an efficient, you know, mechanism. It's why 
you know, so many people are in debt and overweight. But, um, but the reality is, is that advertising works. It's actually safer to be practical and to be a manufacturer that promotes what they make. Um, even though it's a practical premise, you're never going to have a disproportionate return or a true connection with consumers. But that's safer than, you know, when, when companies really go wrong is when they're out there using communications or advertising, which is very easy to change. Um, you know, get a group, any creative group, and you're going to probably wind up with something that can be very emotional and engaging and exciting and interesting. You've got to be really careful because if you're making an emotional promise to the marketplace that then they come in and that is not the experience that they have with the organization, it's, it's disastrous. You actually would have been far better off just offering free delivery and more cheese. Talk about, you know, what is also interesting, Scott, is the core departments in your company. Talk about yeah, that. I mean, yeah. I mean, we have, there's really only this three, uh, there's three disciplines, three departments within Trumpet. Uh, it is, um, it's a client service, which is really the hub. You know, there's two parts of that. There's the relationship management part and the project management part. And we have to keep the trains running on time and we have to manage uh, through the, you know, this is a service business advertising. Um, but really the only two resource departments under roof at Trumpet that, that client services can draw upon is creative and strategy. And that's it. Now we are doing obviously a lot of upstream work with leadership teams. Um, and that's where creative and strategy can have, you know, great importance. Uh, but the other reason for that is that as we get downstream into advertising execution, um, now I'm not speaking ill of all of my colleagues who I love and all full service advertising agencies, but we have just chosen not to have, you know, the PR execution resources or the, meet, the paid media buying resources or the digital um, development resources under roof. Because in my experience, you know, if you, if your PR group is slow, PR is a pretty good idea as a scope for whatever a client's particular challenges. And that's that, you know, being, having, you know, we're responsible for the creative and strategic resources, but we don't need to keep uh, departments busy when they're not the right tactical executional solution for a particular problem. Um, so we you have just awesome, deploy them when necessary. Yeah. And we bring in uh, partners that we, that we're networked with, you know, that we, we spend, I spend a lot of my time um, finding organizations at the kind of the executional extreme of our business. And, um, and if we're kindred spirits and, and they realize that basically they're going to start with a better premise, a better starting point, when they're um, executing what we're working with our clients to execute, um, you know these these are campaigns that that work really well. So I mean, you can have an awesome media paid media practitioner, and um, you know they can do their job great, and the analytics are going to be amazing because of the you know the the recurrence that comes when there's you know this lack of dissonance that being purposeful drives in the situation. So we're able to really partner with our network execution groups, not because clients have realized that it's a commodity and everybody can do it. it, it that's not exactly true, but it's, it's not necessarily the part of the relationship that clients value most. Uh, the strategic and the creative is, is arguably valuable. I don't want to say more valuable, but, um, but it is definitely where we choose to focus. Yeah, what's interesting about that, Scott, is I think I feel like a lot of agencies will default to then start offering those services. That's an easy, you know, uh, default I don't know if you to found offering that. the downstream or default. Yeah, the, the execution, downstream. like instead of partnering yeah. and going, oh, listen, we get all these inquiries. Maybe we'll just specialize in this one type of media right. buying or whatever. But you yeah. made a conscious decision not not to else. do it. Yeah, I mean, which I, I think find interesting. Well, I think that's where that's where the industry went, right? I mean, that was kind of the natural progression of things. It, it was, and I'm like, well, this is not going to turn into a podcast on what's broken about the media commission compensation model for agencies, but you know, it, it's it's not hard to figure out how agencies got where they are. You know, full service advertising agency was trying to capitalize on all the components that revenue could be tied to. Um, when a lot of those components got devalued by the marketplace because so much was getting open sourced or flat sourced or clients could buy their own ads through self-serve platforms. You know, the, it just reduced the, the specialty 
you know, the uh, unattainableness of a lot of the services that advertising agencies used to be able to possess and wield, you know, almost exclusively. Um, there are so many tools that are available to so many people right now, which is, which is good. Um, so uh, it, it's not that it's bad business to be full service. Um, it's just not our business. It's not our, it's yeah. not our model. We're not, no. we don't I find exist it to make money on the you, buy. Yeah. I find it interesting that you just stayed pretty disciplined because I think it takes a lot of discipline to, to do that from my observation. Well, I, yeah, it's, it's harder um, in tough years, you know, uh, in the middle of a stre- in, in, in a deep recession, uh, the last thing a client leadership team wants to hear is about their need to be more purposeful, um, you know, and that's when it isn't bad to just have low margin practices that you can be surviving on through a period like that. But modern consumerism is is now favoring the purposeful. You know, the the eighty seven percent of consumers who desire a meaningful relationship with brands is is just where people are right now. Only twenty three percent, according to Edelman studies or Harvard Business Review, um, feel that they're finding it. You know, consumers want to trust that the companies that they're doing business with share their values. That there's an alignment um, on a more emotional level. Uh, again, that doesn't have to be altruistic all the time. Uh, it can be, but it doesn't need to be. They just need to know that they're not getting duped. You know, the 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 buying public has been Lucy with the football so many times that that when you know the the we we believe that a company is going to do right by us, we go in. Then we have a problem with a product, customer service is you know wretched. We come to find out that you know everything that we're that we're that was promised to us was a lie. And then we get, you know, more and more and more doubtful and suspicious of, of companies. This is just where it has been going since, you know, there was no visibility into these companies, right? Now that we can see that a company, you know, I, I hate to pick on Gillette, but it's just such a, it was such a perfect um, example. But when there's purposeful advertising, making a promise or talking about how toxic masculinity is something that absolutely needs to stop. I mean, that was a beautiful piece of content in 2016, 2017. It was right on time with, with the Me Too movement. It was unbelievably well executed. And the world was like, you know, finally, we've got some momentum behind the elimination of toxic masculinity. It's time to, to, to see life in a different way. But it didn't take very long for the world to realize that Gillette was a toxically masculine company that that they were one of the last advertisers on Tucker Carlson that was a toxically masculine programming and um, this campaign unfortunately pulled people in pulled the world in you know and did in a matter of weeks what advertisers take years to do which is start generating conversation in the marketplace just because the content was so purposeful and was so right and so well done but there was such a gap between what was being said about the company by the company and who the company actually was um, that Gillette wrote off, I believe, eight billion dollars in the in the following quarter you know, on an analyst report. You know, the company was doing fine, but that brand was not. Um, it's it's consumers. We are now waiting for the fall from grace, and um, not that we love it when it happens, but man, it gains a lot of traction, you know, like just to pick on Apple a little bit more just because everybody gets it. Apple and Facebook had nearly identical privacy breaches and security breaches at almost the exact same time um, two years back. And Apple, they both were in the news cycle. You know, the national media outlets were trying to make a story out of both of those things because that gets them clicks and, you know, their ad models start to work. Um, but nobody clicked on the Apple story and everybody clicked on the Facebook story. Apple's news cycle lasted no time and Facebook's news cycle gave way to the an unfollow movement. You know, there were a company that people trusted and liked and a company that people were just not trusting and not liking. And the, the exact same mistake, whether intentional or unintentional, made by both companies at almost the exact same time had unbelievably different outcomes. Now I'm not saying be purposeful because then you can screw up and get away with it. Um, but it's just the power of being purposeful. You know, not only is it Apple's, you know, highest American business cap 
ever, you know, rated ever stock price um, was almost simultaneous with at the exact same time, uh, the single biggest stock market loss in a single day, which was Facebook. You know, it's the, there are higher, there are higher profit and growth and easier companies to run and customer affinity give ways, gives way to customer preference and advocacy and repurchase because one's believable and one isn't, you know, Apple leads with the why and, and everything else is secondary. The products are sold within that context and that's available to, you know, a whole bunch of companies in a whole bunch of different categories. It's not exclusive to electronics or, or credit unions. Scott, I'm curious, you know, when a company comes to you, what are they saying? Are they saying, we know we need to figure out more of our purpose? What are they saying to you? Because I'm sure they don't wake up in the morning, like, we need to figure out our purpose today. But what, what are the words that they're using to, in, when they're starting to engage with you? Well, the initial question, I would say, is very different than the questions once we start getting into this stuff, yeah. right? Typically, you know, I would say the initial question is almost always, we need a website. You know, that is what, that is what everybody <laughs> will, will tell you, um, is we need a website. And, you know, the easy answer is you don't need a website. You need a story. You know, you need a website as a stage, you know, but simply having a stage doesn't mean that the play is worth watching. So, um, you know, that's the, you know, it's not hard to, to move from the conversation about, you know, a technical or tactical want um, and getting into more of this emotional conversation. Mm -hmm. Usually that's the point where they're saying, get the hell out or, um, okay, what would be involved if we were to, to actually do this? Totally get that. I was on the phone with someone earlier today and I go to their website and I said, listen, you are so much more amazing than what's on your website. I hit your website and I don't, it doesn't speak to actually what you have done and what you do. And I was saying it in like a loving fashion and, <laughs> you know, but it kind of, I love how you answer that. Cause they come, Oh, Scott, we want a website. And you're like, you know, giving them kind of the strategy and you know, the, the story of how they should tell their story. It's also a customer experience as well, because someone hits that page and how do they experience that company or brand through that? So, so right. it may start with, Hey, Scott, we need a website. What else do they, what, where is that starting conversation also besides the website? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that the nine times out of 10, you know, the, the people are hiring an advertising agency because they're trying to sell more of something. Right. They have benchmark performance and they need to improve over benchmark either because they want to or they have to. You know, that's what it, their expectation is from the board or shareholders or, you know, it's private and wholly owned. And, you know, why not? We can. Um, if it's a nonprofit, we want to put ourselves out of business, though most nonprofits do not want to be put out of business. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's whatever that that empirically measured goal um, would be. The, our premise is that it is far more likely that you will sell more products if you sell those products within the context of purpose than if you try to sell those contexts within the context of products. <laughs> so it doesn't seem reasonable because ultimately somebody's going to be in the grocery store aisle and they're going to see, you know, my olive next to somebody else's olives. And if I'm just talking about how much better my olives are, then maybe they won't mind the 30 cent delta between my price and their price. Um, yes, that's that works in you know business school, but it just doesn't work in, in real life because we if we value it, we will pay for it. Um, but value is not a practical notion. Value is an emotional one, you know. So the idea is that you, if you think you can get me to value your automobile based on all the practical features and benefits and technology and engineering and, and things that are in there, you're wrong. You know, those are not things that I care about as an emotional organism. Now, they might be things I need to know before I visit the dealership and ink the check, but um, they're not the stuff of consideration. You know, they're not going to get me into the, into the conversation. And even if they are practically superior enough to get me into the conversation, the conversation isn't a very good one because I'm already starting at a rational level that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm able to disagree with as opposed to an emotional level where 
I'm, I'm open to listening to anything you have to say next. Scott, is there a car company out there that you feel does a good job of being purposeful? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, absolutely. I, I think that they're all, um, I think there, there are many that are good and not just Subaru because of their, you know, the connection through love with their consumer base. But the advocacy of Subaru is, is incredible. Subaru, as far as I know, has never had a, you know, a Volkswagen um, type, you know, mistake. <laughs> so maybe they've done nothing ever in the history of Subaru to violate the relationship. And it's just been a, you know, a pyramid of, of advocacy, word of mouth and love. And that's their business model. Um, but no, I, I would say that, uh, you know, there are brands like Toyota that are truly predicated on, a, on an idea, you know, the idea of mobility and how interesting and important mobility is to us as, you know, civilized humans. That sometimes gets lost between there and APR financing, but um, but it's nonetheless. <laughs> you have me at APR financing. Yeah, it's um, nonetheless yeah. there. But I mean, you know, but I think I would say that these are brands that are very smart about creating purpose. Uh, I, I think there's a difference though than you know repeating that you're the ultimate driving machine, actually being an organization you know bathed and baptized in the ultimate driving machine. Like I don't know. Without visibility into the culture of that company, you know, we don't know if it's toxic or if it isn't. You know, um, the idea that they're, you know, companies that should, by all accounts, be successful. I'm not saying that BMW isn't, um, but companies that, by all accounts, should be successful because they have superior engineering and superior design and R&D and manufacturing and service, and they're doing everything right. But their stock price is stuck, or their net profit is seems fixed, and you start asking yourself, you know, what are the problems there. The problem isn't in the management of customer expectations, maybe, you know, that the advertising is speaking to what the product delivers and the ultimate driving machine is what I sense when I'm, you know, driving around in, even if it's an SUV, um, just because sure, it handles better than an Explorer. So you didn't lie to me. Um, but that lack of, an, of, of alignment that in that case lives between communications and the customer's experience of the product, if that is allowed to exist internally, you know, inside of BMW, what is in the hallway is there, you know, um, that is sometimes, you know, uh, why these companies aren't as profitable or as successful as they mm. could be, it's because they're not as easy to run. You know, they're, if you're constantly replacing executives in your supply chain is not giving you favorable terms because you're a pain to work with, you know, and you're playing the manufacturing card and they're just the little guy. Um, there is so much tension and friction in your organization that it's just very difficult to become, you know, a Whole Foods Caterpillar Disney, you know, that you're, you're just not going to be able to get there because the organization, in spite of being externally, having the appearance of being successful, isn't successful. People aren't excited to be there. You know, people aren't, Tenure isn't way up. You know, employee satisfaction is down, but net promoter scores are up. Eventually, net promoter scores are going to match employee satisfaction. It is a natural fact in, in business. You know, Scott, one of the things I wanted to chat about is, you know, you sometimes will happen to have a, a large number of clients, maybe in one category, um, like when I look on your website. Uh, but, you know, you have, I think, made a conscious decision not to niche. And I want to hear your ideas around that because I go to your website. I mean, you have a, a large variety of clients, but I can see inklings of if you decided a niche, you could like I see like a church's chicken and a Chevy's Fresh Max and, you know, a bunch of companies, but along with other things like Louisiana, Feed Your Soul and, and some, you know, Credit Human. So I'm curious your ideas around that conscious decision to not niche. Yeah, the, um, you know, I, I guess, I, I don't know, maybe it's 50% happenstance and 50% and intention. I'd like to think it's 100% intention. But um, what, what I can tell you is that in all of the agencies that we, that we know and we work and we respect, um, there's kind of a couple plays available to agency owners, you know, whether they're privately held or, or, or wholly owned or whatever those things are. Um, you know, you can be a, a category player. Um, and there's a lot of comfort, you know, if I'm, if, if there's been plenty of hospital RFPs that, you know, we just don't even bother answering just because we know that the organization is going to, their first question is, you know, tell us the 17 hospitals you've worked with. Um, 
And there's other, the other way to niche is either, you know, focusing on an audience, you know, we know millennials better than anybody else, or we know digital marketing, you know, maybe it could be a tactical niche that you focus on. Um, what I have seen is that over time, um, you wind up not, it's not rinse and repeat and every bank gets your bank formula, but there's a lot of, there's similarities between, you know, campaigns being executed for, for the, the similar different players in the same category. But more problematic is what happens internally is that there becomes less innovation because there's a playbook that works pretty well. You know, that, that it isn't, you're not dancing agnostically around an idea um, that at every, any execution is viable because nothing has been, you know, you haven't really done this before. Um, and there's a manner of, an, there's, a, there's a level of invention there it just doesn't exist when you kind of find yourself in the same category for, you know, being category specialists is probably great until you hit, you know, the five year mark. And unless you're resetting all of your people, your strategies are going to start sounding very similar and your, your executions and your media plans and your go to market ideas and your analytics platforms, they're all going to be, you know, cousins. Um, you know, I've seen it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's why we don't have, a media department and we don't have a single source media provider. You know, we're able to go find the organization that is going to plan in place and reconcile and aggregate data for us to analyze. Um, that's good at a specific category. I mean, we, we're not anti-categorical experience. Um, we're just not going to do it for one, you know, hotel and then go sell it to 15 more hotels. Um, that Sometimes that is disqualifying. Um, but what our clients do share is that perspective is that belief that that there is a role of purpose in being successful and that they understand it they might not know what the methodology for it is um, but you know that's where we come in so um, that's what our clients share is not a category but um, but that that perspective you know they agree with us <laughs> so from the beginning we are very clear on what our purpose is and if they align with it like consumers would with their brands someday um, you know, we're not making a promise we're not going to keep because it's not a conversation we're going to stop having. Scott, I have one last question. First of all, thanks for sharing all of your knowledge and expertise and stories. And I totally have heard time and time again, a lot of the best ideas and innovation come from outside industry. So, you know, there can be more innovation and ideas potentially if someone comes from outside because they take a fresh perspective on things. I could also see the other side Well, there's obviously efficiencies created if someone's worked in an industry, but so you have the advantages and disadvantages, but um, I'd love to hear, you know, throughout your career, um, some of the mentors that have, and maybe a lesson you learned from a couple of your mentors throughout the years. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I definitely have a mentor. I won't say his name. Um, I, 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 I would think he knows who he is, but maybe he doesn't. I don't know, maybe I should send him a card and let him know. <laughs> You know, it's one of those things he probably shouldn't hear it in my obituary. Um, but he he has, uh, I think, one of the biggest skills that that he tried to convey. And I'm not sure, you know, if I do it. I, I know I don't do it well enough. But I mean, the the idea of loyalty and trust. Um, now, that sounds cliche and passe, but I, he was really talking about it as a management tool um, and meaning, you know, not give people rope to hang themselves and then just come down on them like a ton of bricks. It's the only way they're going to learn. You know, it, it wasn't that it was really, you know, you are far better off arming people with the ability to make decisions and act autonomously in accordance with, you know, a core thought than you are micromanaging them to what you wanted to see as an outcome. And in fact, you know, if you do it long enough and you do it well enough, people are going to start, religiously coming up with ideas that are better than yours. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because I've tried to employ it in my own career. Um, it's fantastic advice. Um, but in a way, it's kind of what we're trying to do with leadership teams that we're working with. You know, it's, it's less about line of sight and micromanagement and trying to get people to conform to some, you know, rigid understanding of a business. And it's really trying to get a group of people aligned and organized in a belief in what a company is about, what the idea of that company is, not regardless, you know, independent what they make, but what they make is not, you know, the most important thing, that there is unity, there's pride, there's uh, excitement, there's, 
you know, you're not miserable when you're parking your car every morning um, and walking into this place or plugging into this place nowadays. Um, and when you then in, engage these people and align them in this belief, they can act autonomously and almost anything that they do with that belief in mind is going to be organically aligned with what you would have, you know, forced them to conform to were you doing it the old industrial revolution kind of way. So um, I didn't mean for that answer to tie mentorship to me applying it to what we do with clients, but it is kind of all the same idea. You know, it's, it's the teaching a man to fish versus, you know, selling them a fish at $300 an hour. Yeah. Scott, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone check out trumpetadvertising.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast on inspiredinsider.com, Rise 25. Scott, thank you so much. All right, man. Good to talk to you again. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.